although it's been live on Google Plus. Now it's live actually broadcasting. So there we go. Oh, interesting. Now the Google Plus page is showing me live stream starting soon because I went live. It's weird. Okay. We're live. It's not on Facebook. It's not? Nope. Nope. Now it is on Google Plus. It's coming in. So you it's probably going to be on Facebook as well. So. Okay. All right. We are live. Sorry, guys. I know that's a little confusing that we uh, we think it started, but we can't confirm it until after we're 10 okay. or 15 seconds in. There we go. There seriously needs to be some Google Hangout upgrades happening here that um, I know. Oh, it's been nothing but problematic. So anyway, we'll get on with what we're going to talk about today. And our topic today is should I do it? Yeah. By the way, hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Inventors Network. Uh, or <laughs> Tom, we, Tracy. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're those back. those that are new. Yeah. And sorry, it's, where it's a week delayed. But Yeah, um, we had some big issues last week and also wanted to make sure I had all the scoop information for those of you who might be interested in our announcement about our live events. Yeah. So anyway. It's very exciting. Yes. But we'll talk about that towards the end. Okay. Um, but today we're going to talk about should I do it? Should you do it? Should you do it? Is that like, should I make it? Should I prototype it? Should I sell it? What is it? I think it's should I all over the place. All over the place. So I've had, um, because of my ink column, had the privilege of interviewing quite a lot of um, startups that um, might have lasted a little too long recently uh, and shouldn't have done it to begin with. And so I've kind of dived into a few things that I learned from that. And there are quite a few reasons why you shouldn't do something. But I, the main thing is, is that you, you aren't thinking about criteria. It's when you do it, it's emotional. And that's a huge problem because you're talking about a lot of money that could potentially be spent, a lot of time that could potentially be wasted. And yet you're making a an emotional decision instead of a more empirical criteria-based decision. Instead of a business decision. Instead you're making it from the heart. Right. Rather, and, and you should be passionate about what you do though, right? Right. Well, you know, I think that the real thing that I've learned from, from talking to a lot of people and, and from comparing them to the sort of level of success we have where we don't have a lot of absolute failures. I mean, we have early failures, like we stop them quickly before we spend a lot of money. That, yeah, that's so it. yes, there's failures, but they're learning failures. They're not, at, you know, I've been in this business for five years and then crashed it because it was never successful. Like there's indicators all along the way that you're not listening to if you go that far. Mm. So, um, so anyway, I, the idea of what I've come to is that emotional decision-making is a significant part of the problem. You fall in love with your idea or your product or your invention. And then what happens is you do not hear or care to hear what other people have to say about it. Mm. And you don't have any kind of objective um, criteria to evaluate it. You don't set for yourself some evaluation um, review points. We on our on our seven uh, step plan, which is available on the site um, on the Facebook page, you can download it from there. I'm pretty sure. If not, send us an email and we're happy to send it to you. Um, and on the seven step plan, we have a, a review and a go, no go kind of process. So we have a review, revise and uh, what is the other part? I forgot. What review, it's. revise, revise and go. go right. right. <laughs> review, revise, go. I was like, I thought it was another R, but maybe. Well, no, there has to be a go if we're, yeah, if we're go. gonna go, right? It's just, if you don't go, you are reviewing it and maybe revising it. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, no, it is actually an R. We changed it. It used to be a go. It's review, revise, and reject. It's oh. an actual stop. Why, why am I blinking on it? I guess that we haven't rejected in a while, <laughs> which we need to actually. We need to reject more. Um, so review, revise, and reject. And so you have to have, I mean, how do you make that decision? And sometimes you don't have enough good information and you continue on to the next stage, but you at least know that you don't have enough good information and you say, okay, well now I need to seek the answer to that so that at the next stage I have a more educated review. That's it. And you don't go 
diving into the full depth of all the costs and all the time commitment and all of those things until you have some of those unknowns at least dialed in with what will make them what will be the signs that they are successful or not successful that I need to watch for so that I stop soon enough so I got to talk to this wonderful woman who ran a kick start stopper project not kick a kick stopper a, not a kick starter a kick stopper and I posted her video in um, in the mentors to inventors network group you can see it um, part way down I think I'm trying to see when I posted it uh, so I can get let you guys know uh -oh, I'm not seeing it in the main feed um, I will post it there and um, and it was a really interesting tell so she got in love with the idea that she would create these striped t-shirts that would be in sports colors so whether you were a uh, football fan, and that could be either kind of football, I'm not being picky here, um, a football fan, a baseball fan, doesn't matter what kind of fan you are, but you could wear the shirts across it and it wasn't logoed, it just had the team colors and you could represent without having to wear a big old logo on the middle of your chest. Um, and so it, um, she fell in love with the idea of it. And she bought 10,000 pieces of different colors of these striped shirts. And she spent five years doing the business and spent about $120,000, which doesn't seem like a tremendous amount, but at the end of the day when you sold, what did she sell? Out of the 10,000 pieces, she sold three, sold 4,000. So she had 6,000 shirts left over. Yep. Yeah, that clearly was yeah, after an five years, unwise yeah, purchase. Yeah. So it didn't work, obviously didn't work. And I and she had set in her mind that she was going to give it five years because five years is how long it takes for you know a business to really succeed or fail. But there were so many signs along the way and she didn't pay attention to them. And that's kind of what I want to point out here is that is that I see so often like when I when I review inventions and when I talk to companies, um, startups and other things, I look at them and I'm like, oh my gosh, red flag, red flag, stop the play. I mean, stop doing it, right? It's and you don't see it because you're in it. So I want you guys, this is what I'm hoping we're gonna get across today, is I want you guys to get a little objectivity to your baby. Okay. It's possible your baby is ugly. It's highly possible nobody wants to hold your baby. And I think we're all, as in, as inventors, at some point we're all guilty of this. I, I think it's very hard to be completely objective. And while it may be initially painful to really consider the fact that maybe your idea isn't great as you think it is, it's really the wise thing to do. And I think the smart inventor, the wise inventor, gets independent objective opinions, not from your friends or family, again, from others, uh, as to whether you've really got something or not. You know, and, and because that, what good does it do you? I mean, th there's a difference between perseverance and, you know, being committed to your idea. I mean, it definitely does take that to bring an, uh, an invention all the way. But, you know, there's also stubbornness and recklessness <laughs> yeah. right, that, that can come into play. And, you know, there will always be naysayers. And I'm not saying to listen to all the negativity by any means. But you need to do your due diligence. Right. And make sure that, the idea, the concept that you have that you want to develop into a fully baked invention and product at some point is actually going to sell at the end of the day. And it is not all about making a big enough run so you get the price point down to a production level. In fact, I would rather see people spend a whole lot more money than it actually would cost in the long term. And then... Um, you know, a whole lot more money than it would 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 cost, you know, per item to do a short run and prove a market than it would be to just spend the big money on a big production run so that you're actually your unit price is actually lower. It, we we all know and we can estimate that the production run cost, we can know what that will be. We can predict that. But 
is anybody actually going to buy it? It'd be nice to find that out before you go spend money on a run of 10,000 or even 5,000. I'm talking about a run of 100 or 200, you know, right. at the most 500, right? And if she had done that, maybe it would have cost her more per shirt, right? But right, she but would have sold through them in a shorter period of time, wouldn't be stuck with trying to move all that inventory. Right. And in her case, she got kind of caught up in the idea of it being a, um, how do I say this? It, it um, got she got caught up in the idea that it um, it was not possible to get the quality that you want and uh, do whatever it, it is that um, she wanted to test out required her to do that. And I think that that kind of sense is very, very common. Like you're saying, it doesn't exist anywhere. So of course I have to build it. I have to show people they don't won't don't understand it. And my thing is that reality is, is that I think if they don't understand it, then it's, um, that's a red flag right there that you have to, un you have to try to figure out what you're not communicating properly to get them to understand that. And the biggest failure that I see overall isn't in the concept itself. It's in the execution of the concept um, in that it's not matched with the audience you might have. So she overbuilt her site, overbuilt her product, did all of these things, and it was a mismatch with the pricing in her case. So the shirt was too much money and it was too premium for something that was actually really plain in terms of its design. So it ended up being a mismatch. So, um, and then she found a lot of heavy price competition with J. Crew and some of these other companies. And, and so she was never competing. So instead of, um, you know, moving, moving out of it and, and getting out of it faster, which was another mistake. Like when you see those signs, you need to do something drastic to help yourself move out of it. She doubled down <laughs> and she would just say, I got to throw more marketing at it. I got to throw me more PR at it. I got to find more influencers. And she would double down on the things she knew already, which is also another problem I see is that when things go wrong and you shouldn't be doing it, it's because you don't know what you don't know. And it's because you have, have an area of expertise and you're you're living in that bubble of expertise and all those other areas aren't getting fixed and touched on in your business and we're guilty of that too i mean we we are admittedly not the best marketers we, uh, that's true marketing frustrates the heck out of me right but it, you know because it's not it's not something that we normally do in our core business. Our core business is that somebody else is marketing the product. Our job is to design it for the marketing channel that they have, whether it's on the retail shelf or online or whatever their venue is. That's our job is to design for that, not to actually execute that. So executing it on our own business is like completely frustrating. And it's also like for us, we're like, oh my God, I have to spend that much money? Like that, that's also like a, you know, big surprise. But the reality is, is that if we wanted to be successful in that, we absolutely have to do that. And um, us not doing it is the reason for failure. So that's really also where I see that so many people, like they budget themselves, they give themselves a, a startup budget and they say, I'm gonna spend this amount of money, but they spend it all on the product and not on the sales and marketing and not on any testing of that sales and marketing with a little bit of money from the beginning. And so when you've done that, you've run out of money and now you've backed yourself into a corner and now you can't get someone to buy it. What good is it? You have made it so that your baby will, even as great as it might be, will never get to market, will never gain traction because you've handcuffed yourself and your marketing ability. So for us, we, this is why our process has shifted so that we really do and test out the things we don't know. Can we test out marketing reach? Can we really reach influencers and will they do something about it? Is there conversion? Do they like what we have? Like we've talked about this. There's a whole video on Prove It, right? Um, and I think it's like the very first one we mm -hmm. have in the system. So go back and watch that again and listen to it again with new perspective. But I really think that the main thing that you have to think about is just sit down and take your idea and, and I don't want you to think about it as like we're risk averse because we are just the opposite of that. We actually will dive, you know, feet first in when we believe in something. But the reality is, is that you must keep your head in the game. 
You must keep your head above water in my analogy there about diving in feet first. You have to have some way to keep yourself objective about what you're working on and some way to evaluate it and stop yourself before it's too late. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, that analogy is a good one, right? You need to make sure you, you build in a lifeboat and so you don't go down with the ship. Right. right. And so for sure, we're talking about early exits failing fast, really, is what we've said. Right? right. Hopefully it won't fail. But if you don't plan for that, then you've committed everything. So you you got to you got to figure this out. I'm a huge believer, especially in this day and age when it's relatively easy and relatively OK to put a product on Amazon and test it and and. You can also, I think personally, some of the easiest marketing to do of a product is really getting key search terms to rank on Amazon as opposed to any other kind of marketing. I mean, Amazon is one of the biggest search engines in the world. Of course, it's for all the products that they carry only. But you list something on Amazon, that's an, a relatively easier way to test something. And if you don't want to become an expert in Amazon, there are people that already are. Well, and you shouldn't become an expert on right. Amazon. Like this is the other thing is that I find so often we get caught up in the idea of like, okay, I need to know this and I'm going to have to figure this out myself and the, you know, there really isn't any time for us to do this uh, ourselves. And you know, the reality is, is that you can't afford to do it yourself sometimes. You've got things in your business you have to be building. You are building a business, not just a product. And you've got to look at that broader. And you know, I get a lot of people who say, well, I'm just going to license the thing. So all I have to do is the product. And that's really actually a mistake in today's world. And we, we talk about this. I think we may have talked about this already. Uh, if not, we will. We'll add this as a topic. But the idea of licensing, in today's world of licensing, you must prove that the dogs will eat the dog food. We've said that before, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. And when you prove that the dogs will eat the dog food, then you command more money in the licensing model you have more you're able to close the deal faster and we've talked with licensing experts we have a, a really great guy who will bring on um, a hangout at some point in the future david and david has done this and he, you know he can license sometimes a great idea but it take it's so hard and it has really low returns when you don't have proof when you haven't taken something through a, a certain level of concept phase, you can't just have an idea. So, you know, that's required today. We also talked about it last week um, or last month. hangout, last yeah. month. Yeah, last hangout. So I guess that was the end of May. We talked about in the last hangout is that the seed stage has expanded. So when you're in a startup, you're not going to get significant investment till you get through that proof stage. Right. That really is the level. So. So this is stuff that's critical to resolve, and this is where you should spend your money and your testing, and not in the final making of it. Because you're also gonna learn something in that process. It might make you make it differently, and that's why we don't make it until, we don't prototype till the fourth step, and we don't make anything till the seventh step. And so it really is critically important that we get through this idea that this thing is so precious, and I've got my blinders on, and I've got my ears plugged, and I don't care what anyone says. Yeah, and you know, in this day and age, prototyping really has taken on a new reality. Right. Because prototype used to be, okay, you're making one. You're making a proof of concept, either functionally or an appearance model or both. Now, prototyping has taken on the role of first production run short production run so that you know with additive manufacturing there's so many more things you can do in repetition more easily right that you can actually produce a product and get market proof um you know in a very short run that you never used to be able to do you couldn't justify tooling for something for a run of 100 or 300 you know right and and this is the thing is that i think that you get caught up in the idea that it has to be perfect yeah. For deciding whether or not you should do something, perfection is not the answer to that. Uh, just sort of a, a communication is the reason for making it. You need to communicate what's special about it. Right. And so, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, you're talking about a slightly different model. So, so I want to segue into talking about 
um, the event. All right, let's talk about the because event. I think that this is the goal of our event. So we're having an event called the Inventors Mastermind, and I will put a link to it within the um, within the uh, different comment areas so that you guys can check it out. It says Los Angeles on it, um, and uh, but it's actually not. It's here in Irvine. <laughs> it's in Irvine, California. Yeah, it got which, moved, which is greater los angeles to an extent but it's definitely you're, you're talking orange county you're you're going to be you know yeah. 35 miles south of la for sure but yeah the the and it had to move because there was an issue with the hotel and construction and stuff yeah there was on. a big so problem with that you're, so you're gonna be happy well, unless you're commuting a long way from north of la but you, you're gonna be happier that this is in irvine you know yeah. over the course of the event so tell us about the Inventors Mastermind, Tracy, and so, exactly what everyone can expect. Yeah. So the guy, the idea of the Inventors Mastermind is that um, – here, I think I've got it going. So just sending it into the link. All right. Tracy's so multi multitasking, Sorry, multitasking, multitasking here. the link yeah. and talking so about it. So yeah. the idea of it is just that there are so many things you don't know yet. And so here's an opportunity for us and some of the people that we've worked with and some of the people that we know. Um, John Livesey is going to join us, and he talks about pitching for startups and uh, how you pitch your product and things like that. Uh, deal terms that you should never have in your distribution or licensing agreement we're going to talk about. Um, we're there's talk about marketing we're going to talk about uh we're going to have jill lublin come in and talk about pr and how you can promote your product and how you should talk about your product with the press um talk about capital and funding and funding models for early stages that's very different from going and seeking equity funding um and the whole real point is to come across the biggest mistakes that inventors commonly make and what to do instead and so we really want to go through that with you guys in it's a two-day event um it runs from nine to five um and uh it's going to be at the hotel irvine on june 28th and 29th what days of the week is that that's a tuesday and a wednesday okay and it's you get are going to get so much information. So by being a part of our Mentors to Inventors Network, you can go to that site that I just sent you guys the link to, and you can click the RSVP button and tell them that Tracy and Tom sent you, and you will have a free pass to come to it. Um, for those that are a part of this mastermind group that we're tapping into to present, there actually are paid members of the mastermind. So they pay um, money per year to be a part of the mastermind group and they get to attend any of the different types of masterminds that go on. So there's a marketing mastermind, there's a publicity mastermind going on at the same time that ours is going on. And that's why we get to have Jill Lublin come over and talk about publicity and PR. Um, so, you know, this is so, so it's kind of great that she's there at the same time time they also have investors masterminds so they have like different types of them and so uh when you belong into the mastermind you get to go to any one of their events at any time so um but it, for people coming who are a part of our network who we're yep. giving passes to that's only a pass to the inventors mastermind that's portion. only a pass to the inventors right. mastermind portion yeah although we're going to have some of those people that are running or participating in the other masterminds are going to come in and talk come in and talk yeah, yeah and and great. uh you know and it's possible that if you're interested in that through them you might be able to get an invite to another one at some point in the future but the i but basically i'm assuming because you're here that you care about inventors mastermind sure. <laughs> so um but our our we are going to give uh, basically in two days a tremendous amount of information that um, is going to be exactly how we launch our products how we do this successfully all the tips and tricks and things that we do and the considerations that we make what will not happen during this time is we are not going to review your invention I'm just right. gonna be upfront about that we do not have time to sit there and talk about your what at, um, at that time so um, but will people have an opportunity to arrange to 
consult with yes. us? Yes, I think it, at the end of the event, if you wanted to set up one-on-ones or do other things like that, yes, absolutely. The mastermind groups themselves have access to us, and I consult with them all the time. And so um, they they have an option to to choose any member of the mastermind expertise panel, with which I'm one. So, um, but anyway, the idea is that you're going to get a tremendous amount of information about what you don't know, so that you can really start thinking about your areas of and I, it's an it's your areas of lack that are going to mess up and stop your project. So it's your gaps, it's really? It's your gap, right. yeah. And we want to help fill the gaps with at least where to go to find more information, who to think about hiring to help fill those gaps. Like what types of people should you go out there and seek? Because we want you to have good criteria because you're launching an invention. That's a very different world than someone launching a coaching project. And there's a lot of stuff out there that's about online marketing and doing all this, but it's actually not geared towards product people. And we really want to be careful and make sure that you understand the difference between that. So you're not caught into hiring a website developer that really is great at uh, doing speaker authors and not so good at doing product based websites. And um, on, and also we have a lot of people who do who claim they do product based websites and look like glorified stores, which are actually really horrible for you in today's market. So we really want to talk about the differences of all those things. We want to talk about what it's like to be on Amazon. We're going to talk about a lot of the criteria for what it takes to get on the shelf. We're going to talk about pricing, the market base versus cost basis. And I know we have a video on that, but we're going to do a deeper dive into the math on that and how it works and what you need to think about to project and plan your budget mm. for your launch. Because you're launching this. I want you to think bigger. Okay. And so it's kind of counter to the should I because the should you do it, it still might be no. But if you're not considering the bigger picture of what it's really going to take to launch your product to where you want it to go, to what your end goal is, do you want to be on the target shelf? Do you want to be on Amazon? Is that simply the stopping point for you? Or do you just want to get it far enough to get someone to pay you licensing fees? So like whatever that end goal for you or for your particular invention product is, what is that? And then what will I need to do? What do I need to plug in to make that happen? And our goal is to give you that big picture, the absolute right path to take to make it happen for you if this is the right thing to do. Again, stepping back, it may still not be the right thing to do. And you have to give yourself some criteria to do that. I would be just as happy if someone walked away from our event and said, I'm not pursuing this invention. I'm going to move on to something else. I'm going to come up with a new idea. I, that is success too. Failing is a successful outcome because we've learned what we shouldn't do. We've learned something and we're going to do something more successful next time. That's a, you know, I mean, we talk about this all the time. What is it, the, the statistic on Edison? He did, he found 100 ways not to make oh, a light bulb. Oh, no, no, not 100. Thousand. He found about 2,000 ways 2, not ways. to make a light bulb. But there was one way, obviously, that worked. And, and eventually... Right. morphed into you know m several other ways going forward but there were many 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 failures talk about persistence he was confident that he could make it happen and and you may be too so it may not even be that the invention concept is flawed it may just be the particular embodiment of it right and it needs to take a slightly different path but or it may be the market you thought you planned it for right. that's the problem and you need to go into a different market that requires a different set of marketing or a different sales channel or something like that yeah. so there are things that you will have to sort out and this is going to get you thinking bigger but what it's also going to do is give you the most accelerated plan so this is what tom and i get all the time how do we in seven years do 250 products with two people <laughs> and you don't do 250 products successfully with two people without a system, without criteria, without not wasting your time, money, and energy. You have to do it with a different mindset. So my goal is to help you sh see that and shift that in two days. And it's also going to give you, correct me if I'm wrong, Tracy, but I think it's also going to 
offer up some resources to these people that are available to help them with these gaps. Yeah, you are under no obligation by no. coming to the event. No. All the information is free. I've been very, very careful with who I, that they are going to give you something valuable that they're not there to sell you. Um, but if you want them, they are available and right. they are my go-to sources. So I'm giving you them as a part of, you know, I'm bringing them to you as a part of the mastermind as well. Yeah, because so. I think that's critical is a lot of times, you know, we I think we've talked about the three feet from gold story on, yep. on this uh, hangout before one time. And and part of that story is, you know, it it may be that to fill the gaps, you need to hire the right expert to help accelerate your project. And that doesn't mean, you know, everybody, uh, we've talked about it, you know, often spends too much money prototyping their product or actually tooling and manufacturing something way too early when really that those funds could have been better spent on hiring the right expert to help prove what is the right specific market for the product what is the right specific price point for the product among right. other things among right? other things like that's a really great uh, you know going back to our kickstopper example Laura Beck and the striped shirt which I sent everybody the link in the group messaging so you guys can click through and watch the video that's on the Facebook it's on group, the Facebook right? groups right. yeah and so um anyway it's she has she spent twenty thousand dollars building a website that was at the like the gap level of shopping. She could have sold it on. She sold more uh, shirts on Amazon than on her website. So nobody that, should ever be spending that much money on a website no. for their own invention. Even if you're building your own vertical company, do it at the early stage. Not at you the early stage. You can create a modern website through WordPress and existing plugins and it can cost what's the average website cost it 3, should be 3500 to 5000 if you most, most 5000 yeah, yeah 3500 you should be able to get a good website, website. you're right with with shopping cart shopping plugged integration in and can everything be it could be maybe 5000 but still that's the kind of money right. you should spend if you're ready to spend money on a website that's it though Right, and and to me that includes your branding, like in that particular mm -hmm. case, because you don't need a high level of branding. You need enough branding to have a good, strong foundation. So that should right. five thousand dollars. That's why I say five. I think it gives you a good foundation for a good branding to start start brand. You know, with an idea of where you're going to go with that. But you know, I mean, this is the thing. It's like we have this information, and we can really write check it for you and make sure it's a fit and make sure it's in the in um in line with where you want to go remember licensing versus uh on the shelf versus in online amazon or you know wayfair it could be any one of those online resources so when you look at those three places they have a different model and different path that they take to do that and it might be a path that to get to on the shelf might be a path through Amazon into licensing and then you're actually on the shelf under somebody else's brand. It might happen that way for you. But it's all you have to think about that from the very beginning so that you can plan this out and you don't overspend and you don't take too much time because time in the retail market is is money. You if you don't get to market fast enough, you lose out. In the invention world, that's the same way right now. I mean, the number of patents being filed every day is crazy. It's increasing every month. Yeah. So some of the other things we're going to talk about is communicating. Um, we're going to talk a lot about IP. There's going to be a lot of discussion about the value. You mean communicating? Yeah, communicating with your attorney is a big one, and yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna help talk about that one, right? But you know, and then John Livesey will help talk about how to communicate what's special about your IP to other people, to laymen, right, right. <laughs> you know, important. to the general. Yeah, because the, that communication is very different as well. So there's going to be a lot about communication, a lot about mm -hmm. mindset. There's going to be exercises you get to do in there which can be specific to your what and what you're working on and we will then dive into them and talk about them but um but again it's not a one-on-one -on -one situation this is a group a group event group class so just want to make you aware of that that there's not any kind of pitch opportunities we're not doing any of that um i don't think that's useful to a lot of people i think that that's only useful to the person being pitched to they have an agenda they want, you know, they're hoping to seek ideas. I'm not a big fan of some of the pitch fests that don't teach you how to pitch properly first. Sure. So um, if you're interested in one of those, though, let me know. Send me a message in Mentors to Inventors Go because I know one is a very special pitch event is coming up, which has a whole sort of 
back end workshop to it. And that's coming up in Dallas in July. So I can refer you to that one as well. Um, and that one has an invitation, but it's a cost so as well because they're teaching with something. But anyway, just wanted to make you guys aware of this going on. If this is uh, well trafficked at the Irvine event and we get a high level of, of people like we expect, then there's high likely that this will fold out to 30 cities around the US. And I would like to someday take it international, but we'll see. Right now, we're going to do Irvine. <laughs> I think we have we have enough yeah. people to serve in the U.S. that that'll last yeah that'll us last quite a, quite a while. Time. So it'll yeah. be thirty cities over the course of a year, from July to the next June, actually. And um and I think the next cities that are on the list of things would be Salt Lake City and Denver, following um following this Irvine Orange County event. So, so anyway, that's kind of what's going on here. We hope this is going to be helpful for you guys. We want to keep bringing you sort of exclusive little um, tips into workshops that might be going on, things that might be helpful for you, um, any kind of um, uh, resources that we think are useful. That's kind of a part of what our group is about. Right. Um, and so um, at this point, we won't have... Um, another call before the event so that the event then, is the end of june right yeah the yeah, event yeah. is the end of june so um and it would be the next call so we'll actually be skipping the next uh hangout and we'll do it following the fourth of july after the fourth of july okay. after the fourth of july good. so yeah that wednesday after the fourth of july we'll put it back on the calendar the fourth is a monday isn't it? yeah i think it is so it'll be the sixth of july i think um, um, yeah, we should probably look at the calendar before we get here. Or <laughs> 30 days in June. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it should be the six. Should be. <laughs> anyway, I'm not seeing any questions yeah, from anyone, but now's the time if you want to ask some questions. Um, and uh, otherwise, we're going to sign off a little early. And um, but you know, if you have any questions as you're going into um, the of, about the event itself ping us at info at, at mentors to inventorscom and it's a member of the number two mentors to inventorscom Just like it is listed yep. here on the on website, Facebook or on uh, Google plus and all that. It's, it's the same way. Exactly. And, um, and so, yeah, anything you want to, um, to ask about it, I'm happy to answer it. Um, there's an organizer to the event that I'm not in control of. So because it's not my event, I, I don't run these masterminds. Um, and, uh, so, you know, they follow up with you and they get you registered and everything like that. But if you have any issues and you're not getting what you think you should from there, from them, please let me know. Um, well, anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening. Have you gotten anything, Tom? I don't see anything okay. on the Google Plus page. So, okay. I hope you guys have fun watching the Kickstopper video. Is that somebody who wants I, to? I doubt it. Doubt it. All right, you're just getting a phone call. <laughs> yeah, sorry, trying to close that off. I thought my phone was off. Usually it is. It's only on vibrate. So sorry, guys. Um, but anyway, yeah. Hope you guys have fun watching that Kickstarter video. It cracks me up. It is hilarious, <laughs> but it's so realistic. I can't even tell you how many people I've seen who've done stuff like this. So um, yeah, it's just uh, you know who've who have like well, I can say we've done that. I can remember boxes and boxes of pens all over our house. Now, granted, we were selling them. They were moving through. Oh, but yeah. We would receive these deliveries of stylus pens into our houses at cases and cases at a time. Oh. And our daughters would be like, you know, overwhelming it. So okay. this video is very similar. Hold on. We're yep. not going to go yet because we do have a question. Okay, great. We got a question uh, from Tridimensional is art. I... I 3D art, and I'm not sure exactly who this is, but anyway, um, at least by that name, I know people have contacted us. But anyway, it says, "Where should you prove your concept?" That's the question. I, it really depends on where you plan to sell it. I mean, my th the video that we talk about, which is a couple back, I think it's probably the first one or the second one that we've talked about on this series of of hangouts so far in the Mentors to Inventors Network. When we talk about prove it. I mean, that's really the thing. Oh, it's this, Eduardo. Oh. It's Eduardo Martini. I, I didn't know that. Was, did he change his name? Eh, yeah, doesn't matter. Anyway. He says, if you develop a different product, where where should you test yeah. it? Yeah. So you should test it in the market you believe, you first believe is the market for it. So hopefully you've found a need and you think that you're filling a gap or of, of a need in the marketplace. 
and you're going to go to find that target demographic. So where can you reach them most? So for us, a lot of times we design for women. Women are the largest shopping demographic in They're, the U.S. In anyway. the U.S., right. they're a huge portion of Amazon, uh, Amazon, and all retail shopping. So, if I can access them in a way at which I can get into some of their groups, or I can just do a um, a get in with an influencer and ask some questions, and that's really where I go to prove it first. So, um, sometimes though, we you know we have people who who have like maybe a phased version to their invention. So like you start out with the kind of, um, we call it like the, you know, the, it would be like the beta version, right? Like, so it's not quite your full concept. Maybe you didn't fully tool for it. If you've got that and you can make a really small run, then we try to do something like we'll actually run it straight on Amazon. So it just really depends on where your market channel is and where you want to go. You want to test the same demographic. That's the first thing you want to test. And then you want to test the difficulty, the, the, the difficulty level. Boy, I can't talk today. The difficulty level of accessing that market in the most important channel within that market. So the most important store within that market or website, whatever that may be. So in the case of Amazon. And that's why we will do a 500 to a thousand piece run if we can in a 3d printed version or it doesn't even a, have to be that it big, doesn't though. have to be that big no you can run it smaller to just test how difficult is it to access and do that okay so uh follow-up question is and what about selling in it in an informal way would it be valid so i'm going to give you a good example of that one that's a good follow-up yeah, question, that's a good question. i think there are legitimate informal ways to gauge that now i don't know about in brazil that you probably have the same type of an uh, selling environments that we have here in the US. I would say you could do a very low cost uh, event type of a, a selling uh, opportunity like we have farmers markets here in the US where people go, yes, usually on the weekend to buy fresh produce, you know, food, vegetables, fruits, things like that. But there are other kinds of things sold there too. A lot of times there are artisans selling crafts and other types of products. And you get a real cross section of people at these things. I mean, you have to make sure it's a fit. So make sure you're selling something that's probably mm. a gift item or jewelry or something that fits the model of whatever that event is. So you make sure that that's the case of that um, and make sure that that demographic is, you know, make sure that they, you know, it, it, it's already tied at kind of an artisan mindset if they're they're probably interested in sustainable products already because they're at a farmer's market type buying organic fruits and vegetables right so like it has a profile of the type of people that it wants to be you know that it wants to profile um and so that if that fits your product then it's the perfect place to test it so yes you can do things like that you could also try um, some kind of flash sale, that's an online option to do that. But I think you have to do it within a market that you're very, very sure that they trust you already to be a valid test. If you're just going out there and doing one of these like Amazon or Facebook flash sales, which I see all the time, the likelihood of somebody buying from you who isn't already a part of your group or who already knows you is difficult. And if it's somebody who already knows you, you're muddying your data. <laughs> So that's where you really have to go out and say, you know, hey, is this really the right place to do it? Online is really hard to do a test in. It, it is. I think there are other opportunities and actual local retail, though. Yeah. You may be able to more independent shops uh, yeah. if they are carrying the similar type of category of product you want to test. Or they just have a right probably, demographic. You could probably get someone to do a, a, a local test um that is on consignment really where they're not actually buying your product and reselling it but they're putting it on the shelf to do it where we were talking to somebody recently about a product oh that might have been uh, they had a product that might have appealed to people that were buying um cakes like wedding right. cakes right and and here's a good example and we we counseled this person to go get some market proof because she had product, she had physical product to be able to be sold yeah. and, you know, was having trouble dialing in some price point issues and some demographic issues. And it, she had an opportunity to create a, a one-off, only a single retail display, sort of a pop-up 
you know, display to show the product and give some bullet points, what it's about and the price point and put it in those bakeries. It was not a, um, it was not a, um, it wasn't a cake product. It was an accessory. Somebody who's buying a cake might also want to buy for that celebration event, right? So that was an idea that that was, you know, you want to think about what kinds of other things might the person who wants to buy your product also be buying at a similar time maybe and, and then piggyback, off piggyback that. on that opportunity. Yeah, so. and so I want you to be careful in thinking about what your goal of the proof is, Eduardo, because that's really important. If your goal is to prove that the product it has a fit, then that's a great way to go about it. But if it, the goal is to figure out whether or not you can get traction in marketability of something, then you really have to dive into like, putting up a shop on Etsy, putting up a shop on Amazon, or putting up a shop in whatever place that you feel is best fit for your product and seeing if you can access that and drive traffic there and gain organic um, as well as uh, purposeful traffic. So you're building it directly because that may not happen. And that's really, I think, the harder part than finding out whether or not your product's good already. I think you should already have probably, if you've gone out and done some, you know, demographic testing of it, like we've talked about going into a nonprofit group and checking it out with them, then you may already have a good indication. You feel that the product's strong. But the marketing access and whether the marketing access is even going to pay attention to your product is really the key. It's not about a good product. It's about whether you can capture their attention and the attention of their dollar. Right. Which has, which even if there's no competition for their product, there's always competition for that dollar. Yeah, you got to think how you're going to make that emotional connection with that consumer to get them to give up their money for your product. There has to be, a, you have to really dial into that valid reason. Right. right? And it's, it's tricky and, to and, do. And, and like we said, we're not marketers. We're not the best to help you dial that That's why in. we use experts. <laughs> and that's why we hire experts yeah. to help us with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so anyway, it, this is kind of the way that um, it's, it's two types of marketing, uh, two types of testing rather. It's market testing and product testing. So when you're testing your product and your features, that's one thing. When you're testing your market reach, that's another. So we've talked about this before, actually, in the 3D print um, world. And I know you listen to the podcast that <clears throat> the ring cam. So we talked about that back around around February, Valentine's, Day. Around yeah. Valentine's Day. Yeah. And the ring cam was a great product where they tested the product where they gave that product away pretty much to a bunch of guys who were Getting, you know, ready, getting to propose, ready, getting ready, right? getting ready to propose, engage, and they got product feedback and product testing and testimonials and and a lot of data and feedback on how to make it work. That was one way that they did that, and they three D printed that at that stage and made that prototypes by hand. Didn't make a tremendous right. amount, and they learned a valuable lesson because originally they thought that they were going to sell these ring camera boxes to people that were going to propose, and that was a much more expensive proposition. They ended up finding out. That that cost, that that price that they were asking people to pay to buy that product was really too high and, and not very many people were going to do it. And they came up with the concept so then it, it didn't of convert. renting it. Yeah, so it didn't convert. So they came up with the idea of where are we going to be able to capture the market the fastest? And keep in mind, these guys did not come up with this themselves. They hired a sales expert, a guy we know from called the Buyers Group, Michael Byers. Amazing guy who's had a tremendous history in creating sales traction. And he said the fastest way for us to accelerate this is for you to go and partner with the jewelry shops because that's where all your customers are going. And it's not in competition because it's not a piece of jewelry. So they may be more happy to do that. So then they created a couple of these pop-up displays, discovered that the price point was a little too high from that model, and then went to a rental model from there on. And now it's just like got its own sales force, its own traction. They didn't have to invest in that. So that was such a smart method of, of doing it. But they did it because they were testing the product and then testing the market reach. Right, and they ended up discovering that the jewelry stores could actually sell it for them, and they were able to have a couple markets. They could sell the products to the jewelry stores. The jewelry stores 
would then loan them out or rent them out depending on how they wanted to do their business. So the customer ended up not being necessarily the end consumer, although they do do that on their website. They will rent them now themselves to you from anywhere, but you could make it be sort of a branded special. Jewelry shops are a local market really in the U.S. There are local jewelry shops everywhere and there are some This is not something you normally buy online. You go and pick out your engagement ring, right? You go and look at it and you may develop a relationship with a jeweler so they tend to trust them so have that same sales force out there help sell your product or even buy your product and they rent it out so i mean there's lots of opportunities they discovered different ways to reach their market and it was all through doing some initial testing as tracy said with 3d printed version of their product they refined the product and how they were going to reach the customer. But if you had imagined that they had spent all that money diving in and creating a $20,000 sales and rental website themselves and doing like this high-end thing and then discover that nobody came, you know, you had nobody buying it, that would have been a travesty of expenses. And so the reality is, is that because they did this very low budget, very cost uh, conscious, and went about it very slowly and involved the experts in an area where they didn't feel comfortable. They did, felt comfortable with the product and the tech, but they did not feel comfortable with the sales and marketing. So they brought in someone who really did them well, you know, serve them well. Yeah. So anyway, we hope that helps. And it kind has. Of you a good example. already sent us a thank you oh, over good. Google Plus well before we went into the ring cam example. Uh, but I felt it was still a great example. Yeah, it's so a it's great example. Yeah. Um, and I will add that link in here in the comments field so that you guys um, who may not have uh, seen that one um, already because you're not a part of our WTFFF podcast, although you're welcome to listen if it interests you, but it may not. And that's OK. No, it's actually a really good, even though it's a 3D printing podcast that episode is and there's a blog post related to it you should link that's to that what as i'm well, going to actually find yeah so that's a great lesson of a a business strategy a growing business with a brand new invention product and how they went about doing it um and and you know i, I don't want to paint the picture that they did it right from the get-go i mean they had they some yeah, they, they, had they, they had some you know some successful failures and pivoted along the way. But the point is the hired experts figured out what those pivots needed to be, found their proper market, found their proper sales models, and now have gone into business in a significant way and they're doing a great job of it. And I like the example as well because it's a, it's not a traditional market. It's not just throwing something up on Amazon, right? right. Which is not a bad place to test a product, but it just has to be the right product But if for you're that just gonna channel. put something up on Amazon and not do some marketing things with it, right. then you're actually really not helping yourself at all. Yeah, Amazon, you can't just put it up there and expect that Amazon's gonna bring the cus customers. It takes work in many different areas and excuse me we have some experts that we work with to help dial that in and um you know we've talked about that a little bit on a past hangout and we're going to be talking about that more in the inventors mastermind event and you know again it just comes down to seeking out and hiring the right expert to help you with what you don't know right so super critical but great examples i, I like where this has gone today, Tracy. Yeah, I think, absolutely. I think that's really yeah. useful information. Great. And I am putting in that link right now into the Mentors to Inventors chat. You found it already? I found it finally. Wow. Yeah, it took me a while. Multitasking. There you go. <laughs> and the Google Hangout thing seems to be working okay today. <laughs> well, anyway, so we will be back with you guys on July 6th, as we said. Um, and we'll give you kind of a recap of how... Um, things went with the event and whether or not we're going to continue to the next level. And um, hopefully uh, some of you guys will be able to join us. Yeah, Love please that. do reach out to us over Facebook or as Tracy said at info at mentors number two inventors.com and uh, you know, can ask any questions. Tracy's put the links up there for the event, but feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, it's going to be a great event. If you're a serious inventor and I mean serious inventor, not just, you know, you have an idea and you you want someone else to help make that idea a reality. You have to be a serious inventor, very passionate about your project. You want to accelerate this. You want to get to market. This right. is for those that really want to launch. And it doesn't mean that you want to launch it all the way to, you know, you might want to launch it to 
to licensing. It doesn't yeah. have to be launching to being on the shelf somewhere. Yeah, no, no. You don't have to want to create a whole vertical company around it, but you also, you, you can't be expecting someone else to do it all for you and that they'll pay to do it all for you. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. In reality, you need to be serious about making it happen and maybe spending some amounts of money, but in the right ways. That's what we're really going to talk about. Right? Yeah, yeah. We want we you know we see a lot of people who come through who spent tons of money at like Invent Help and Edison Nation and all of those other things, right. and you guys haven't gotten anywhere. I mean, and I ask, I, I'm always at, oh, is your patent issued? Oh yeah, it issued two years ago, and and you're still trying to get this marketed. It's probably out of market by now. You know, it, it's you've passed your prime, waiting for it to happen. And how much money did you spend? Oh, I've spent. Fifty thousand dollars, or twenty-five, or whatever. It's you know some of them. I've I've met a couple of people who spend one hundred and twenty. So you know, it's, look, yeah, it's way up there. There's nothing wrong with spending twenty-five, fifty thousand, or even a hundred thousand dollars in the right ways to really achieve your goals. It's it's absolutely you know may need to happen, but make sure you learn enough to know that you learn to know what you don't know that you're spending it in the right ways in the right places. That is it, really going to accelerate you and move you right. to where you want to go. And that's what we're going to be detailing for you, how to make sure you're not getting taken advantage of, but are actually accelerating your project forward. And how you make those decisions along the way. So right. anyway, guys, thanks so much. We can't wait to talk to you again and uh, have a great 4th of July for those of you in that's the U.S. Right. Um, and, and for those of you that will be at the Mastermind, we look forward to seeing you there. That's right. Thanks again. Bye.